Hi, this is Jeff Zeig, and I'm the founder and the director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation, and here I am in our library in Phoenix, Arizona. I had a series the last two years called Five Minute Tips for Therapists. I refer you to YouTube if you want to see any of those uh, lessons. This is a new series. It's a series on Milton Erickson. I've published many of the stories of my time with Milton Erickson. For those of you who want to see those in print, a lot of them appear in the book Experiencing uh, Erickson, and that is available through Taylor and Francis Publishers. But this is uh, my idea in this series, is to make a record of some of my stories of Milton Erickson, even though it's been uh, 40 years since uh, Erickson passed away. Some of these stories are important in, uh, in helping therapists and people to better understand who Erickson was and to be able to get a flavor of how to take some of the innovations that Erickson created and bring them into everyday life. Let's start at the beginning. It's December, December of 1973. I have been reading about Milton Erickson. I'm enamored, charmed with what I've been able to, to read. And I started studying hypnosis towards the end, I believe, of 1972. I was trained in a more traditional version of hypnosis. And then a psychiatrist supervisor, Dr. O'Connor, suggested that I read the book Advanced Techniques of Hypnosis and Psychotherapy, a book long out of publication, which has been supplanted by the collected works of Milton Erickson, available from the Milton Erickson Foundation. And that was, Advanced Techniques was a collection that Jay Haley had edited of Erickson's papers. I read these and I was amazed. It was light years beyond anything that I imagined could be considered psychotherapy. At the time, I was trained more in a humanistic tradition as a Rogerian therapist. So I wrote a frivolous postcard to my cousin who was studying nursing in Tucson, and I said, Ellen, I've been reading about Milton Erickson. This man is a genius. If you ever go to Phoenix, Arizona, you should visit him. Well, my cousin Eric Ellen wrote me back and said, Jeff, don't you remember my old roommate, Roxana Erickson? And Ellen and Roxana had been uh, students together and spent part of their junior year, I believe, in Mexico learning Spanish as part of their college curriculum. And so uh, having had met Roxana, I remember it was about 1970, and I uh, was visiting San Francisco and met Ellen and Roxana. And I remember Ellen pulling me aside and saying, Roxana's father is a famous psychiatrist. And I remember saying, I won't hold that against her because at the time I was more interested in organizing against the Vietnam War than I was interested in, in psychotherapy, even though it was my day job. So I uh, wrote to Erickson and introduced myself. I sent him a copy of a paper that I had written, which was working with the auditory hallucinations of schizophrenic patients and, and uh, applying some of his techniques of utilization to helping uh, schizophrenic patients to cope with auditory hallucinations. I sent him a preprint and I introduced myself. I said, please, can I come to Phoenix and be your student? And Erickson wrote me back a letter and basically said no. He said that he was too old and he was too ill and that he wasn't uh, taking students. And he personalized the letter. This letter exists in the Erickson Historical Residence. If you ever come to Phoenix, you can see how Erickson lived the last 10 years of, approximately the last 10 years of his life. And uh, uh, in that letter, the end of that letter was, when you read my work, presupposing that I would, you don't have to emphasize the words, the techniques, the pattern, the suggestions. The really important thing is motivation for change and the fact that no human being ever fully knows his capabilities. Now, I must have read that paragraph sitting in my car when I opened up that letter, I must have read that paragraph five, ten times. I was 
charmed. I was amazed that this genius was taking his time to personalize a letter to an admiring student. So I must have written back and said, okay, I don't need to be your student. Can I please visit? And not only was I going to visit, but I was going to be Dr. Erickson's house guest. I don't even remember how that was arranged, but I would stay um, in the bedroom that was adjacent to his office. There was a, a small, very modest guest house where Dr. Erickson was uh, still practicing uh, psychotherapy and where uh, special visitors got the opportunity to stay. I had been attending uh, a workshop in the Los Angeles area about hypnosis and there I encountered Ernest Rossi for the first time and I encountered one of Erickson's uh, f seemingly first generation students, Dr. Pearson. I was intimidated. I, I knew that I was going to visit this genius who had x-ray eyes and he was going to understand me better than I understood myself. At the time, I had a master's degree. I was a, a marriage and family counselor in California, but I was young and 26 years old and new to the field and, oh my gosh, I'm getting to visit Milton Erickson. Well, I, I miscalculated and uh, I was driving from the Los Angeles area to Phoenix and rather than getting there at a reasonable time, I believe that I arrived after 10 o'clock at night and I was terribly embarrassed. I couldn't find his home. I went to the house next door and I said, I'm looking for Milton Erickson. And they said, who? And I said, well, 1201 East Hayward. And they said, well, this is 1203, so it must be next door. Uh, they didn't even know who was living next door to them. So I arrived late at night. I'm terribly embarrassed about coming so late. And I knock on the door and Roxana greets me and she says, here's my father, Dr. Erickson. He's sitting to my immediate left. I think he was watching television. And what Dr. Erickson did was completely unexpected to me. And he was looking down and then gradually, slowly, in mechanical movements, he looked up, and then same mechanical movements, looked across, fixed my gaze, probably from what I know of Dr. Erickson now, he looked through me, perhaps he timed my breathing, and then he looked down the midline of my body, as if he were suggesting go down inside. Now, I, I was cataleptic. I had no resource for dealing with that. Nobody had ever said hello to me like that before. I thought I would walk over and shake his hand and introduce myself. And he took me completely out of pattern. Roxana took me by the arm and took me into the next room and said that her father was a practical joker, but that was no practical joke. It was a complete induction of hypnosis. Now, the words hypnosis were never said, and uh, the invitation to go into trance, that was never said. But what Dr. Erickson did was he mirrored, modeled, the kind of cataleptic movements, the mechanical movements that you might see if somebody was doing an arm levitation in this kind of ratcheting, cogwheeling way that is common when people are in trance. And then he created some destabilization, took me out of pattern, Probably he paced some of my rhythms and then non-verbally suggested, go down inside. Now, if there was ever a moment in life that I was going to have a plenary trance, that was the moment. And um, I'm a little sorry that Roxana disrupted that, but it was uh, an, a, a, an instrumental understanding that hypnosis is a conceptual realization. Hypnosis is something where you change your state and the use of words is not going to be necessary in order to induce hypnosis. Hypnosis is based on how someone responds to the meaning, to the innuendo, to the implication in any given situation. Now, I followed Dr. Erickson for um, intermittently for more than six years. After that moment, I visited him as often as I possibly could until I moved to Phoenix in 1978 with the goal of being closer to Dr. Erickson. 
and uh, effectively entered into private practice because I was working at a hospital as a child psychologist, but Dr. Erickson was basically retired from practice and he started referring patients to me. And with, uh, within the year, I was in a full-time private practice, mostly courtesy to Dr. Erickson. And I never saw him do that kind of nonverbal induction again. This was part of the improvisational creativity of Dr. Erickson. He just invented that moment. It wasn't something that I think that he planned, but uh, as was common of Dr. Erickson, he would introduce himself in very uncommon ways. And uh, that was my first introduction. Now, in the next video sequence, I'll talk about the time that I spent with Dr. Erickson in his office on the next day. Thank you so much. This is Jeff Zeig. Here I am in Phoenix, Arizona at the offices of the Milton Erickson Foundation.